her joy, her pride, and I know that she loved all of you. And to have this beautiful music, thank you so much for sharing these incredible gifts that you have. When the family comes to share and to give and to celebrate, and in the end, we take the time to recognize that God receives all of the glory. And so we read from the book of Psalms, the 118th. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather in this place and time to recognize your presence and your power. Your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And because of his life and death and resurrection, we have a sure and certain hope to eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for this incredible gift of grace and mercy to us. Today we celebrate your adopted daughter who was entered into your eternal kingdom, beloved Miss Anne. May this time bring honor to her life and Lord, may all of the glory go to you for what you have done. And Lord, as you promised in your word, you will bring comfort to those who are in need. And so Lord, we ask for your comfort to come and to fill this place. And as we receive it, may we give it away one to another, sharing that comfort, encouraging each other. Thank you, Lord, that we can be together your presence is with us, and we have the honor of celebrating Miss Anne today. And so we pray now in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for hymn number 426, Blessed Assurance, verses 1 and 2. Thanks. 
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come to his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. From Proverbs, the 17th chapter, the 22nd verse. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And from Psalm chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. If you are able, please stand as we sing, Him, Love Lifted Me. Please stand.
She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the staff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of, of snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her nothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity, dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellent. <laughs> the Jews have done so well. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works break at the gates. take your hymnal and turn to 428 and we'll sing verses 1 and 4. Let it dwell with my soul.
We will begin our New Testament readings in the book of Colossians, third chapter, the 15th verse. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And for 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And Romans, chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. For today's meditation, I have chosen Psalm 150. I've only been here a short time, as many of you know, about a year and a half. And so I truly missed out on Miss Anne in the fullness of her glory and you seeing the beauty of her gifts. I visited her a couple of times at the house with the family. My favorite times, though, were with our youth group when we went Christmas caroling at her place. And to see her sit there and to sing and see the joy on her face, she loved music. And she loved her family. And she knew every word. You know that she had her struggles these last few years. She didn't miss a beat. She didn't miss a word. I think she was louder than all of us, Kevin. And it was absolutely beautiful. Psalm 150 says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What an incredible psalm. And I think that Anne would love to hear this music today. This beautiful music. I hear so many of you singing at the top of your lungs out there, and it's great. Singing praise to God for what he has done. Isn't it special when you find out, oh, that's what I'm able to do. I figured it out. And not only I figure out what I'm capable of doing, I can use it for God's kingdom and God's glory. And Anne, I know I was told at a very, very early age. I forget the name. Somebody told me, told me the age she was when she started playing. What was it? 12 years old in the church until she just could no longer about 60 years you find something you're able to do for God and you do it with all your heart with everything you've got for as long as you possibly can that is a kingdom mindset saying God I want to praise you and I want you to use this then you create it, which messes up all the time, makes mistakes. I want it to be a vessel 
that is used for your glory. To give you praise. My hope this morning, this afternoon for you is, is that you have found out what that is. You know what part of you can be used for God's glory. For some of you, it's you can bake. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you so much. For some of you, you teach, you preach. Some of you are engineers. You know those numbers, you can build a bridge that will actually stay up. I like you, because when I drive over it, I want it to stay up. Everybody has gifts to use them for God's glory, for God's kingdom, to love others, to share our gifts, and to give all the praise and glory to God. And was such an incredible example of that. And the word love, it's thrown around a lot. And maybe a little too casual. But you enter into a place like this. I'm not calling anyone out, but we went, they went to read the scripture. And it was really hard for them to read that scripture. See how hard that was? You know what that is? That's love. When you love someone so deeply that you can't even get the words out. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing to be ashamed of at all. It's actually, it's absolutely beautiful to see someone so overwhelmed by love for someone. That's when you know someone has made a real impact on your life. It's not just, yeah, I can do that. It's casual. It's no big deal. No, they've made a real impact on your life so meaningful that you can barely speak. You can barely communicate because you love them so much. They love you so deeply. That's the type of love that we talk about when we talk about the love of Christ. That is God. A sacrificial love. It's the number one word used for love in the New Testament. It's a special little Greek word. It means I'm going to sacrifice whatever I need to for you. And that's what Christ did on the cross for us. I will give everything. And he gave his life. What more could he give? An innocent man, wrongly convicted, tortured and put on a cross for you and for me because we're sinners. And we need a Savior. And now we can put our hope in him for our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins and our salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That is the message of hope. That is a message of peace. Because when you accept it, it brings you real peace. You're finally connected to your Father in heaven. And you become an adopted son, an adopted daughter. And then you get to find out how to use your incredible gifts for God's glory and how much fun that can be. And you won't be alone for the rest of your life. You'll have the Holy Spirit with you, and you'll get to spend eternity with God forever. That is the witness of the power of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That he made that possible for the entire world. And we have the joy of being able to accept that, receive that, live it, experience it, not just now, but into eternity. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. May we do that with all of our hearts as we continue to sing, continue to give witness, and continue to give thanks for Anne's life. Hymn number 51, How Great Thou Art, verses 1 and 4.
lady for 88 years of life experiences to share with us even to the very end. Love, the most important lesson she taught us. Love for the Lord, for the church, family, friends. Even on her weakest days, she always managed to say, I love you, or show us just how much she loved us. When she hugged you, you always knew you had been hugged. Don't think you're going to walk up and half do it. Mm -mm. Put your arms back around me. Mm -mm. She would say, I love you. She made sure those arms went all the way around. She taught us to love her pancakes, though that wasn't hard. They had the crispiest edges, and she always made melted butter to pour on top, and then you dipped in syrup. We loved to spend the night and sleep in the hattie bed. It had the best sheets and was extremely comfortable. My favorite was staying on Friday nights because she usually ran the cash register at the barbecue, which meant I got to set on the drink cooler while she did it. She taught us to love music, both playing and singing. The grandkids and Kimsey learned early on how to turn pages of music because Saturdays were always reserved to roll Granny's hair and to practice the organ. <clears throat> we learned to appreciate plays and tolerate Lawrence Welk. Grandma and Granddaddy had season tickets to the plays at Raleigh Memorial Auditorium, and if we were lucky enough, we got to tag along. Saturday nights, if they weren't at the barbecue, was reserved for Lawrence Welk, but she sat quietly and watched, and only talked during commercials. And you may not know this, but Grandma was a little on the competitive side, especially at Easter. We would search for hundreds of candy eggs, I'm pretty sure she froze from year to year, and we searched them year after year after year. But honey eggs was not always cured, did not cure her competition side. 
she started trying to keep up with Stephen. And for those of you that don't know, Stephen was a little busy when he was younger. So Grandma decided one Easter Sunday she would race him around the house. She dove across the finish line. At least that's what we'll say. The truth is, she tripped, fell flat of her face. After the initial shock, we laughed and laughed and laughed. And I'm pretty sure I remember Granddaddy scratching his head, shaking it, saying, now, Ann. <laughs> when we were too old for a traditional egg hunt, she used her love of flowers to educate us. She would write clues, and we went on a scavenger hunt to find our special egg with a special prize. I think she thought we were smarter than we were because the eggs were almost always near a plant or flower, and rarely did we know its name. Mondays were for barbecue deposits. That's where we learned how to stamp the checks, for deposit only, and sit in amazement at her calculator skills. It was always my goal to be able to run a calculator as fast as Grandma could. I'm almost there. She loved to read. She would sit up all night <clears throat> to read a book and finish it, sometimes an entire book. She loved to read to the grands and the great grands. She taught me to iron clothes and Granddaddy's handkerchiefs and how to crochet. I bet many of you have used at least one of her dishcloths. There's one thing, though, I pray none of us learned how to do, and that was how to back a car. <laughs> Bless her part. She was always backing into things, and one particular time, we had gone to Surf City, and she and I went to Tillman's when it was still there in the parking lot. Now, Tillman's had a pretty big parking lot, but right in the middle was this big light pole. And you guessed it, she backed right into it. She stopped, she turned, she says, I think we've hit a pole. <laughs> I could not laugh, stop laughing. I think, I know we laughed all the way to 7th Street, got to the trailer, and Daddy said, what is wrong? He got so mad at me, all I could do was say, just go see Grandma. <laughs> so finally he realized she had backed into the pole. And it was a small dent, but it was just about the perspective. You know, from my perspective today, we are celebrating the life of an amazing woman. I pray that we always remember what she taught us. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 sums it up. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Grandma, we love you. A bushel and a peck. A bushel and a peck and a hug around the neck. A hug around the neck and a barrel and a heap. A barrel and a heap and I'm talking in my sleep about you. About you.
You know that she was born to Bernie Bauman King and Sarah Annie Stevenson. Um, and she was born in Wake County in Aunt Hattie Buffalo's house. Aunt Hattie was my grandmother's sister. She grew up on Highway 210 down here at Camp Branch, where the mother has um, had her house there and has been living for quite a while, just at the bottom of the hill. She attended Cleveland High School for 12 years. That's where, when it was a high school. I know it's back to high school now, but it was 1 through 12 at that time. She graduated in 1952. She was supposed to go to college, but she decided she needed to get married instead. Now, when I would talk to Mother about her life, I would often say, Mom, you know, we just need to share your life with others. I think people can learn something from what you have done with your life. And she said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't share. Well, I got to thinking about what I would say today. She also said she didn't want her casket open, but if you came to the funeral home last night, you saw a beautiful mama laying there in the casket because some wanted it open, some would say, some said, let's close it. So we decided we'd open it down there, we'd keep it closed here. Um, so I, I decided, well, if we can do that, I might can talk about her life a little bit, maybe that she didn't want to talk about. But I think that God puts us in places where he knows that we can grow, where we, he knows that we can learn his love and know what we need to be doing for others. So, Mother got married in 1952. That's when she graduated from college. She was married to a gentleman named Cheryl Norton. So, in the bulletin where you see the N beside my name, it stands for Norton. Steve's last name is Norton. He's the only one that gets to carry it on. But, um, that was Cheryl Norton. He lived here in this community. His mom and dad lived in this community. He enlisted in the Army at Fort Bragg, and um, that took Mother here in the East Crossroads area for two years, and then Mother and our father and I moved to Germany. Steve was born in Germany. We moved to Fort Seals, Oklahoma. We moved back to Anger, and then we moved to Columbus, Georgia, where my two younger sisters were born, and then back to McGee's Crossroads because that marriage ended. But guess what she got from that marriage? Four <laughs> wonderful <laughs> children. <laughs> and I would tell Mother that, and I said, look, if that hadn't happened, what would we, where would we be? We'd be with somebody else. We wouldn't be with you. And she would say, well, I guess you're right. Uh, Mother had a sister, Aunt Nancy, she, whom she adored. It was granddaddy, grandmother, Aunt Nancy, and mother. She also adored her mother-in-law, her brother-in-law, excuse me, Tom. He's sitting right back there. He looked after her as only a brother would. He looked after us, too. She had two boy cousins, Bobby Joe and John Harold Stevenson. And I think I saw Johnny coming in. He's right back there. They were like her brothers, and they were mother and Aunt Nancy's best friends. There were also many King cousins from my granddaddy's side. Um, Mother would especially like to go to see her Aunt Annabelle and Aunt Royline. She liked to go to their homes. Aunt Annabelle could really cook, cook a lot. She lived in Coates. I love going there because she had this farmhouse table with benches. I've never seen that before. You know, we sat in these whatever kind of chairs, you know, we had a metal table. And I just thought that was great that she could cook good, so it was great to sit at her table. And then Aunt Roy Lane, she was kind of the quiet one. My granddaddy said she always would show the love. And Mother also said that too. She, uh, Mother learned how to just sit and talk. And how if you had a quiet soul and you were very loving, people would just love you. She was musical, as we've already talked about today, and you've been singing, and it's just sounded wonderfully. Susan and I have done our best. We've made some mistakes, but hey, the Lord doesn't care. Um, she played for weddings, worship services here at Providence and in the community from the age of around 12. She, her feet would not hit the pedals. So whatever that sounds like, when you're not able to use the pedals, that's the way she started, and it didn't seem to bother anybody because she played for a lot of weddings. 
people would say, oh, she played for my wedding. She was 14 when she started, when she played for their wedding. She wanted people to think positively of her, just like we all do. That's why she didn't want me to share her history. I would tell her, I said, I'm going to tell you my story. I said, I think it's a positive story. And she would say, don't do that. And I would say, Mama, none of us are perfect. You have taught us that as we have grown up. And she said, no, we're not perfect, and I certainly am not. Mother was married three times, and I believe that those three marriages are her life's testimony to us, knowing and learning how to be a beloved wife and a true Christian. Just a little bit about those marriages. Marriage number one, I've already talked about. That's how she got us four beautiful, wonderful children. <laughs> um, she didn't go to college, which granddaddy and grandmother weren't happy about, but she eventually did go to business school and um, get whatever she needed there. She would say, don't talk, don't talk about that to anybody. And I would say, Mama, sometimes our choices are not the best. But God shows us how good can come from our choices. He helps us, and I hope that that's what you get today. We are not any of us going to make the right choices all the time. But if we trust in the Lord, we know he's going to guide us and show us where we need to go. Um, let's see. The first marriage ended in divorce. Um, for five, and this is what I think is so special about Mother's story. About mother's story. She never went looking for another husband. Never went looking for another husband. So she was divorced, and she was single. She raised four children during those single years. We, we were all growing, and she did it by herself. With the assistance of our grandparents, <coughs> Nancy and Uncle Tom, people here in the church. And she taught us how to love Jesus, how to smile, be kind to each other, be obedient. To be pleased with what we have. Because you know, with single parents, you, know, you don't have everything somebody else might have if they have two or they got one done. She taught us how to sing, how to praise the Lord, how to play the piano, and enjoy those that loved us, our family. No matter if you were kin to us as family or not, just church family. <coughs> Marriage number two. After being a single working mother, for five years, she became good friends with a gentleman in this community. What a change that made in the, our four lives. We children now had to share her with someone else and that person's family. Mother's second husband was a farmer. Talk about learning to work. We did it. <laughs> we learned how to pull tobacco plants got a short story about that in a minute. Chopping and, burn, and barning tobacco. Chopping tobacco and barning tobacco. Setting sweet potatoes. Feeding hogs. Chasing hogs. <laughs> on Sunday mornings when we get ready to go to church. But the hogs are in the azaleas and in mother shrubs. So we got to go chase them out and go back in the pens. We did that. In the... Um, Plant bed, tobacco plant bed. 14, <coughs> I'm 14 years old. Mother and I are out there pulling tobacco plants. It's a hot day. I was 14, so was I happy? No, no. no. I was complaining. My back hurt. I said, Mom, I stood right up. I said, Mother, I will never marry a farmer. <laughs> Shelton Langton developed lung cancer. It metastasized to his brain. Mother cared for him through treatments until his death. She did not neglect her duties as a mother to us. And what did we learn? We learned about Jesus' love again. 
how to be kind, how to be caring, how to get along with each other, how to work hard on the farm. We had to learn how to work. We learned how to work. And after his death, mother became a work away from home mother again and continued to raise all four of us alone. Marriage number three. Ten years later. So you see, my mom didn't go out seeking. She had her four children. She had a family. She had people that loved her. And she was she just waited for whatever God had planned for her next. It wasn't an easy life, but we all loved each other and we got along fun. We had what we needed. But ten years later, her late husband, Paul Stevenson, whose wife who had died two years previously, asked Mama out. And the rest is history. Again, Mother and her Lord were teaching the four of us lessons. How to love Jesus. How to be a compatible marriage partner. And it's a joy to be a compatible marriage partner. That there are many turns and twists in life. You don't know what's coming. And with God's help, we can twist and turn the correct way. If we'll just allow him to help us. Mother and Papa Paul were married for 25 years. And that I will say, and I don't know what anybody, anybody else in my family will say, I think those were probably the 25 years that she enjoyed living. She enjoyed all her life. But they had a good time together. Of course there's ups and downs when you have a blended family. But everything worked out. In those 25 years together, Mother and Papa Paul raised Chris, who was nine, when they got married. And Chris, ten? Okay, he was ten. So, Chris, I'm going to tell this quick story. Mom and Papa Paul came to our house where we were living at the time. We were still living, oh, well, I wasn't there because I had graduated and I don't own the work. But um, everyone else was. Were you there? No, you weren't there. You got married. Okay, thank you. It's worth the rest of me. But anyway, we all got together, and Papa Paul, we called him Mr. Paul, Papa Paul. Papa Paul and Mama were there, and they said to us, we want to get married. And I spoke up first. <laughs> I said, Mother, Susan and Allison are graduating from high school this year. Are you sure you want to raise another child? <laughs> And you know what she said, Chris? We will do the best we can do. And I'm sure everything will work out. And it did. It did. So, from the age of 10, Mother and Papa Paul were together, raised Chris, raised all of us, helped all of us. All um, eight, there were eight children together because she had four, he had four. Um, we all got married, grandchildren were born, Papa Paul was the only granddaddy that our children ever knew. So he was very special. Um, there were ups and downs, as always, with any, any life, but those 25 years were full. Mother worked with Papa Paul at the barbecue restaurant in the nursery. They laughed, they sang together, they took vacations, they were involved in this church right here in many, many ways. In November 2007, Papa Paul was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor, and he went to see Jesus in January 2008. And since that time, Mother had been again single. And she stayed single. Again, God had given Mother a partner who needed loving care. She had taken care of her second and third husband because they needed loving care. Their children needed care. We still needed care, and she didn't neglect us. She had more children that needed a smile. They needed her love and attention, just as Stephanie spoke about. So at that time, God's marriage plans for mother were complete when Papa Paul died. As I said earlier, I do believe that Mother's three marriages are a testimony to how God uses each of us. He gives us a mission to fulfill when we least expect it. 
Those missions come in little boxes and big boxes. How we manage what's in the box are the lessons that we learn in our life. If we follow Mother's example, we'll allow God to help us open up those boxes and manage the contents. <coughs> Throughout Mother's missions and bumps in her robes, detours, she managed to keep her smile and loving spirit. And I have heard many of you talk about her sweet smile. And she did have a smile and a big hug. And she wanted a real hug. She didn't want just a little hug. We know she was blessed with the attributes of a Christian that are found in Galatians 5, 16 through 22. She possessed and exhibited all of them. Love especially, her service to our Lord, to her church, her family, and friends, always originated from a deep spirit of love placed in her by the Holy Spirit. She was full, full of joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. She lived by Proverbs 3, 5, through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. With God's help, Mother filled her boxes with many things. Stephanie already mentioned a calculator. She can move her hands fast while she's looking over here at the road of um, figures that she needs to put in there and she never made a mistake. I don't know how she did it. She worked as a bookkeeper. She worked in the kitchen at Stevenson's Barbecue when they needed help there. She spread her joy to patrons of Stevenson's Barbecue because she'd go out and talk to anybody and smile and you know, she'd just greet everybody. She cut down trees to relieve tension. That's true. And she planted many things in the dirt to relieve tension. She manicured her yard with a riding lawnmower that Steve had to make sure was running. She raked and she picked up pine cones. And she was picking up pine cones even as her dementia was developing. She had to have her pine cones picked up because she didn't need to have those in the yard. She attended the International Bible Study Fellowship meetings with Ann and some other members of this church once a week. And they told me that they just had wonderful conversations going there and back. And then sometimes she would say, Sherry, I need for you to read this scripture. I'm just not understanding it. Can you help me? And I'd say, Mom, I'm not sure, but we'll come up with an answer of some kind for this question. I said, you want me to write it in your book, or are you supposed to write it? I wasn't sure. She said, you can write it. That's fine. That's fine. But she did it um, until she couldn't do it anymore. She received um, the Presbyterian Women's Honorary Life Membership Award several years ago. She was very active here at Providence Church in the Presbyterian Women, in the music here. As we said, she played, she directed the choir at one time. Um, she, was, she helped with the card ministry, the prayer shawl ministry. Stephanie already mentioned all the um, dishcloths that she made, and probably many of you have, have one of those. And all while she's doing all this, she showed us how to love each other how to use the gifts God has given us for others. Her smile was contagious. Her genuine spirit showed that she really did care. Her family and friends loved her hugs, and she would introduce her friends by saying, he or she is one of mine. It didn't matter if you were her true daughter or son, but she would say, when she introduced you to someone, he or she is one of mine. She tried to do her best and to be present for all of us, but she did have a stubborn streak. <laughs> As her dementia progressed, she was more aware that her immediate family was not present with her. She tried more times than not to walk or ride her golf cart across that 210 highway to see her mom and dad over in that white house or to find her sister Nancy. She ran from her caregivers because she didn't like people in her house with her. <laughs> she would run down to Steve's house and tell them that something was going on in her house or somebody there wasn't supposed to be. She said, I'm not staying with that woman. She wanted to continue to drive, but her keys became lost. She stressed, she looked for her keys everywhere. Um, 
Those keys were lost in my car. <laughs> she left them in my car. I didn't ask her for them. She left them in my car. I got home and phone level. I saw they were there. I went in the house and I said, all right, there's something in my car that I think you need to um, do something with. And he said, what? I said, there's something in my car you need to do something with. He came back in the house. He said, I found that and I've done something with it. I said, good, because I didn't want to have to tell her that I had hidden them. <laughs> but then we had to find them again because she agreed one Christmas to give Samuel her car because she wasn't driving it anymore and he needed a car to get to Raleigh to work. So Sam and Samuel and their family became the owners of mine and it had been Paul's car and the keys reappeared. I don't know where R.H. put them. I never did ask him, but he found them. Her independence and her memory slowly drifted away. She didn't like that a bit. Many times she might say, Mother needs my help to cook supper. I need to go over there. Or, I have to pick up the children. She was always wanting to pick up the children. She cared for some of the grandchildren when they were smaller. She would go pick them up from school. And she was remembering that in her dementia days. Or she'd say, I need to go home. I'm not at home right now. Many stories or white lies were told to calm her down and try to help her understand that she didn't need to do all those things she wanted to do. One of my examples, we had enrolled her in hospice and the chaplain would come. He brought his guitar and they would sit to sing, and she knew, that, knew every word of every hymn that they sang. She would sing. But one afternoon, we were sitting down on the back porch, and she quit singing. And I said, Mom, what's wrong? I've got to go check on the children. I left them in the car. That I, I don't know if their mothers are coming. And I've got groceries for my mother. We've got to cook supper. And I said, Mom, Jonathan's here singing to you. You need to sit right here. I said, you need to be nice. Let's, let's sing. I said, why don't you sing with Jonathan? I'll go check on the children. So they sang. I walked out to the garage. I stayed for probably 30, 45 seconds. And I came back in. And she said, are the children, where's the children? I said, mom, the children are fine. While I was out there, their mamas came to get them. And I had time to take Granny's groceries to her. So she's fine. She's cooking supper. And she's getting along very well. She said, oh, okay. I said, just sing with Jonathan. She kept on singing. I looked at Jonathan on his way out the door. He was a chaplain. He's a preacher. preacher. And I said, I don't know that I've ever lied in front of a preacher before, but I just have. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do to get her calm. She didn't like her disability of memory, not having her memory. It took away her independence, and she had had to be an independent lady for most of her life. But it did take away her inner strength, her smile, her hugs, until about the last two weeks of her life. During these last two weeks, she did a lot of sleeping. During about the past three weeks or so, she quit eating, quit drinking, but the last weekend, right before she died, she was able to say very softly, I love you. On Wednesday morning about 2 a.m., she met Jesus at the door of heaven. She answered yes to his questions, which were, do you believe I am your Savior? She said yes. He says, have you spread the word of salvation to others? She said, yes. She said, I have strived to believe, love, and have faith as best I could. The pearly gates opened for mother. She received her angel wings and began singing, dancing, praising God with a heart full of joy as she was met by her mother, her father, her sister, her husband, Paul, and all the others that she has missed for so long. Mother, we know that we will strive to give your love and smiles and hugs to others just as you did. And we love you, and we have loved you, and we thank you for all you've done. At this time, we are going 
once he sings, all of us, in a minute, a beautiful star of Bethlehem. Every Christmas Eve, when my family all get together at Mother's, wherever we were, she would pull out a beautiful star of Bethlehem and say, we have to sing this. Well, and we've been doing that for years. This past Christmas, Mother was in her bed. She could not play the piano, and she played the piano up for us on Christmas Eve up until this last Christmas. Harris, Stephanie's son, said, Aunt Sherry, I was playing the piano. We were singing some songs. Mother was in the bed. And we were about finished. And Harris said, Aunt Sherry, we've not sung the beautiful star of Bethlehem. And I said, Aunt Susan, can you find the words? <laughs> So Susan got the music, and we sang O Beautiful Star of Bethlehem that night. It's a Christmas carol, but when you sing it and read the words, it doesn't have to be a Christmas carol, but it was written in 1940 by a farmer as he sat in his dairy cow barn on Christmas Eve. It's about the star of Bethlehem that led the Magi to the first place of Jesus. My family is going to stand and sing the first verse and the chorus. And then I would like for the rest of you to stand and help us with the third, second and third verse. So, family, stand, let's sing. <coughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
benediction is from Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. You're welcome to call right behind the family to the cemetery. You can go out the back behind the church or out the front.